Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to this session that is being hosted by Together Women Rise. Um, Beth Allen Holloman will tell us soon our transition from Dining for Women to Together Women Rise, because officially we are registered at CSW65 as Dining for Women. So uh, what a wonderful way to make a huge and wonderful start. So just as a reminder to all our participants, if you could mute yourselves. Uh, we will begin the panel shortly. Uh, we are recording this session, so if you miss something, perhaps you will be able to watch this later. Um, and we will take it from there. So, Beth Allen, go ahead. All right. Well, I am very excited to uh, be here tonight with all of you. Uh, Together Women Rise, just recently, we just recently transitioned from Dining for Women to our new name, Together Women Rise, and we are a powerful community of women and allies dedicated to achieving global gender equality. We have hundreds of local chapters across the US where members learn about and advocate for gender equality issues. We give grants to organizations that empower women and girls in low income countries. And we build community to forge meaningful connections that increase our collective impact. And I think that we can all assume that we are all here today because we share the belief that women's rights are human rights. And we wanna make sure that the world knows that when women and girls are treated equally, the world is healthier, safer, more peaceful, inclusive, and economically just for everyone. It is our great pleasure to co-host this event with UNICEF USA and our other past and current grantee partners who are also contributing to intersectional environmentalism. So I am going to share the bios of the people who are joining us tonight, but I'm shortening them a bit. I want to remind you that they are uploaded uh, to the site, to the uh, UN, NGO UNCSW site. So first I'm going to welcome Alicia Godsberg. She is the Assistant Director of Global Programs with UNICEF USA. She has been with UNICEF USA since 2016, focusing on water sanitation and hygiene, climate, energy and environment, gender, and HIV AIDS. So welcome, Alicia. Ashley Emerson is the program director for Health and Harmony, a uh, Together Women Rise grantee partner. After 12 years working in post-crisis humanitarian development, scaling sustainable solutions to healthcare access, education, and economic development, Ashley transitioned to working on addressing the climate and nature crisis. So welcome, Ashley. We're so glad that you could join us tonight. And next, I'd like to welcome Kaheya Pacheco. She is a passionate advocate for indigenous people's rights and the co-director at Women's Earth Alliance. She loves to focus on, well, she focuses on intersectional environmentalism and justice for all. She's a, uh, she has been a part of the 15 year global initiative that trains resources and catalyzes grassroots women's networks to protect our environment and build healthy, safe and just communities now and into the future. Kay Yoder is the director of US operations for Ripple Africa, which is an international nonprofit or operating in Malawi. Ripple Africa uh, works on small scale education and healthcare initiatives, as well as its large scale environmental projects. In addition to her role with Ripple Africa, Kay is also very involved with Together Women Rise both as a member and a grant recipient. She is also involved in Rotary where she is the immediate past president of her local- oh, I had was, I had was okay. Sarasota, Florida. 
And I am very pleased to uh, have as moderator, uh, Dr. Veena Kondke, who holds a bachelor and master's degree in psychology from the University of Mumbai and a doctorate in human development from the University of California, Davis. She is our amazing director of grants and partnerships at Together Women Rise and is going on almost seven years. So mm -hmm. thank so you, Vina, for I'm organizing just... this wonderful panel along with Monty. Monty is our second moderator. She is the Deputy Director of Global Partnerships at UNICEF USA. She currently works with um, organizations whose mission and visions align with UNICEF. And she primarily manages relationships with women's organizations based in the US. And Kelly Presida, who is the Manager of Global Cause Partnerships with UNICEF USA, she works with civil society organizations partnering with UNICEF USA to equip them with marketing and communications collateral showcasing the impact of their support for the world's children. Welcome to all of you. This is an incredible group of people and I will turn it over now to Vina. Thank you, Beth Allen. And thank you to all the panelists and thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. Happy St. Patrick's Day for those of you who do celebrate St. Patrick's Day. So just as a reminder to all of us about what this is and where we are at. The major themes of the 65th session of the, on the Commission on the Status of Women is the full and effective participation of women in decision-making and public life, the elimination of violence, sustainable development, achieving gender equality, and the empowerment of women and girls. So our objectives on this panel is the following. If I could just remind all of you to please mute yourselves. Thank you. One is to apply a gender lens to the discussions and debates on sustainability, the environment, and climate change. To acknowledge the deep connection between women and girls and humans to ecosystems. To evaluate the costs and consequences of climate change on the livelihoods, health, and well being of women and girls. And this is where each of our panelists are going to share about the work that they do across the world. Then we will move to discuss policy and advocacy policy. initiatives that acknowledge environmental justice and gender justice and move towards gender sensitive responses to climate change. And finally, to raise awareness of initiatives that allow women and girls a seat at the table to empower them to tackle problems in their communities. And we hope that we can leave all of you, the audience, more knowledge knowledgeable about all these issues. And then to talk about what the next stage is, what are the next call to action. So without any further ado, let me call on our panelists to present an overview of each of their organizations. So Alicia, I'm going to start with you. And Kelly, perhaps you have a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you so much, Vina, and everyone at um, Together Women Rise and everyone joining today. It's really my honor to be here uh, to talk about UNICEF with you and the partnership that we've had with Together Women Rise. Next slide, please. So just uh, in, the, in the broadest sense, uh, UNICEF is the United Nations Children's Fund. It was founded in 1946 to help children in Europe after World War II. And then its mission expanded to help all children everywhere. UNICEF is a UN agency. It's a humanitarian and development organization, and it advocates for the protection of children's rights and for scaling and sustaining programs that help children survive and thrive. UNICEF is a tr truly global organization with a presence in 190 countries and territories. And Together Women Rise has partnered with UNICEF on several projects, including maternal and newborn health, programs for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, empowering Syrian refugee women in Jordan, and addressing gender-based violence in South Sudan. 
As a global community, we know that it's only through collective partnership like this that we can have sustained impact on the ground. Next slide, please. So now we'll talk about the impacts of climate change on children. UNICEF understands that children are the least responsible for climate change, but they bear the greatest burden of its impacts. And this is because children, especially young children, are more vulnerable to diseases linked to climate change and to the effects of air pollution on their developing lungs and brains. Next slide, please. Gender and climate change also have a unique relationship. Um, evidence suggests that women are disproportionately affected by the social, economic, and health effects of climate change. For example, women's mortality rates are higher than men's during disasters, and they're also more likely to experience disruptions in access to health services, such as maternal and postnatal care. Women are also more likely to experience human rights abuses during disasters, including trafficking and sexual violence. For girls, the risk of child marriage increases during crises as households seek ways to manage financial burdens. Next slide, please. UNICEF supports the inclusion of women in decision-making in their communities and integrates gender issues into its climate strategies to minimize risks to women and children. UNICEF also supports programs that empower women, such as providing technical skills for the green economy, and includes the voices of children in solutions because of the outside, outsized effect climate change is already having on them and will have on the future. Next slide, please. So this very wordy slide has uh, UNICEF's climate strategies on it. UNICEF has, you can see here, four climate, main climate strategies. And for each one of them, UNICEF has a call to others and a pledge of something they will do. And these strategies are make children a focus of environmental strategies, empower children as agents of change, protect children from impacts and reduce emissions and air pollution. Next slide, please. And this is sort of a visual depiction of UNICEF's four main advocacy and program climate goals, all of which in include the engagement of young people. So those are climate smart health centers, reducing exposure to pollution in the air, soil, and water, climate smart schools, and climate resilient water sanitation and hygiene services. Next slide. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about an example of UNICEF's work on the intersection of gender and climate. And that's a project in Madagascar where UNICEF is supporting a gender and climate education project. So Madagascar is a country that's very vulnerable to cyclones and it has very weak coping capacities. There's also a very unique environment there between 80 and 90% of the flora and fauna appear nowhere else on earth. And 83% of the rural population relies on the natural environment for their livelihood, meaning the cost of climate change is extremely high. On gender, the country has very high rates of child marriage with around 40% of girls married before the age of 18 and 36% of girls becoming mothers before 18. To address all these issues, UNICEF is working with the government and other partners on a project in the Android region, which is an arid region affected by drought. Only 26% of the population there has access to basic water and just 6% to basic sanitation services. UNICEF is improving basic water and sanitation services at schools and providing environmental education for students in Android. And some of the project's outcomes include ensuring their safe water sources and separate latrines for boys and girls at schools, which improves safety and enables girls to stay in school and manage their periods, uh, providing environmental education, including through hands-on learning, and constructing cyclone resistant schools and other disaster risk reduction measures, such as pre-positioning supplies, so schooling is not interrupted during a time of crisis. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much. Ashley, I believe you, you will be our next speaker. Thank you so question. much, Vina. Uh, and thanks to um, Together Women Rise, we've been so fortunate to be a grant recipient 
um, of your generous support uh, and ambitions to support women and girls all over the world. And thanks to my fellow panelists who are just doing remarkable work. Uh, really honored to be here with all 75 of you today. Um, so I'm Ashley Emerson, the Program Director of Health and Harmony. And we have about 13 years of experience using a unique anti-colonial approach that really honors the wisdom of rainforest communities and transfers investment of global resources, particularly from the global north, into these communities' locally designed solutions to address the climate and nature crisis. So our model protects and restores tropical rainforests, uh, and it's a solution to the twin crises that we see unfolding every day um, with the collapse of nature and global heating and climate change. So we really strive to prevent global temperatures from rising by the devastating two degrees Celsius. Um, and we really follow the science around this, the IPCC report that basically gave us 10 years to be able to significantly address this challenge. And so um, we are doing everything we can to do that. And at the core of what we do is something very simple. It's a methodology called radical listening. And could you please move to the next slide? Thanks so much. And when we sit in community and radically listen, we're really guided by the experts, the rainforest communities who design solutions to address, most importantly, local deforestation. And then we invest precisely in those solutions. So in order to, for humanity to have atmospheric carbon by 2030, we've committed to making a significant impact on this drawdown. Next slide, please. So what, how we do this is really through a paradigm shift when it comes to knowing how to live in balance with rainforest ecosystems and stopping forest loss, rainforest communities, and in particular women in these communities are the experts, not us. And we really position the indigenous and traditional rainforest communities as the climate and conservation experts, as the scientists who identify and interrupt the root causes of this degradation. And it's really these communities who hold the key to our collective longevity and well-being. So to reverse, to reverse deforestation in our experience, rainforest communities from Brazil to Indonesia don't design these kind of you know, siloed approaches, sector-based approaches to um, the solutions that need to be enacted they design complex exchange systems that are defined by typically some elements of needing access to healthcare, addressing conservation, job training, livelihoods, and education. And women in particular are at the center of this process. Their proclivity to prioritize sustainability, health, cooperation, and community is brilliant and life-saving for our planet. Next slide, please. So we recently um, did some research on our model in the first 10 years of data from our proof of concept site in Indonesia called Gunung Palung National Park. And what we found is that over 10 years, a $5.2 million investment returned over 65 million in carbon averted, saw a 90% reduction in logging households, 67% reduction in infant mortality, protection of 3,000 critically endangered orangutans, and the list goes on. And again, these were solutions designed by communities. Um, next slide, please. And so since proving efficacy in this model, um, which so often in our work is driven by and led by women, we hire women first, we prioritize women in leadership. Uh, we've been able to replicate in three different sites and are now on a path to scale. So two remarkable dynamic rainforests in Indonesia, Manubu Special Reserve in Southeast Madagascar, as well as the Shingu River Basin uh, and the Brazilian Amazon. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to share with you uh, this photo from a couple weeks ago. Um, these are some of the over 600 women who recently um, graduated from an agriculture training and are harvesting 
their first yields of SRI rice um, and doing this ahead of cyclone season, uh, as Alicia mentioned, and followed by hunger season or lean season was so important, especially during COVID, a time when people are stressed, you know, financially, the healthcare systems are maxed out to be able to have food security has been critical. Um, and how we support these communities is also through healthcare. So we run mobile clinics every day. Next slide, please. I also wanted to share with you this photo of Erica Pellegrino. She's a medical practitioner in Brazil, supporting all of our medical programs in the Shingu Basin. Um, and in her heart, she's an activist and she's also uh, a psychologist. And so she's always thinking about uh, not just the human health angle, but the mental health and the eco anxiety that these communities are experiencing, um, particularly the traditional and indigenous communities. Next slide, please. And later we'll talk a little bit more about advocacy efforts and what we can all do collectively um, to bring more attention to this at the most basic level. So thanks so much. Thank you so much, Ashley. So Kahea, it's your turn to share with us what Women's Earth Alliance is doing in this area. Thank you, Vina. Um, thank you, Beth Ellen, for that introduction. And hello to everyone joining us. Um, it's great to be here with all of you and with these amazing, amazing colleagues on this panel. Um, Ashley, just listening to what you were sharing, it's, it's so incredible to be so aligned in the work that we do and to see so many of our sister organizations doing really important and meaningful work that, that we feel that resonates so deeply with us. Um, so thank you for, for everything that um, UNICEF and, and Health and Harmony are doing. Um, we, uh, we were lucky enough to work with Together We Rise almost 10 years ago now in 2012. Um, to elevate the work of our colleagues in East Africa to bring um, women-led water solutions to their communities. It was an incredibly powerful partnership and one that we continue to be honored to have done in, with the support of Together Women Rise. Um, as uh, Beth Ellen and Vina said, my name is Kahia Pacheco. I use she, her pronouns. I am a co-director uh, here at Women's Earth Alliance. And while our team is located all over the world, our home offices are in Huchin, Ohlone territory, in what is currently known as the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, next slide, please. WIA is a 15-year global initiative um, that trains, resources, and catalyzes grassroots women's networks to protect our environment and build healthy, safe, and just communities um, now and really with a view of into the future as well. Um, since 2006, we've worked at the intersection of women's rights and the environment, creating programming that serves grassroots leaders around key environmental themes, um, such as climate change, water, agriculture, land protection, and energy. Um, and over the last decade and a half of our programs, we're proud to say that more than 10 million people in 22 countries have implemented environmental solutions across Sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, the Americas, and Indonesia. Um, next slide, please. Um, around the world, our alliance leaders are saving indigenous seeds, selling clean cook stoves, launching sustainable farms, um, providing safe water, protecting land rights, and more. Um, and through our grassroots accelerator program, which we currently run in Indonesia, Kenya, and here in the United States in partnership um, with Sierra Club's Gender Equity and Environment Program. We are providing leadership, strategy, and technical training to support grassroots women to scale their climate and environmental initiatives and solutions while connecting them to, um, a really key aspect is connecting them to a global alliance of peers, um, as well as mentors and funders. Um, next slide, please. Our why in terms of why we do this work is really because it's a must. Um, as ecological crises intensify, we know that women and children um, are hit the hardest. Uh, and around the world, women risk their lives every day just to ensure their families can access clean water, 
um, food and land. Uh, women in impacted communities hold a cumulative body burden of pollutants that are in their immediate surrounding environment and could, pot could potentially be passed on to future generations. Um, and as well as the fact that women are often the mothers of movements. We see that in the Greenbelt Movement in Kenya at Standing Rock um, and more places around the world. And we also know that from these front lines, grassroots women leaders are often the best positioned to design the solutions our world needs um, because they have their finger on the pulse of those resources, just like um, Ashley was, was sharing about their work. Um, it's globally recognized that women's leadership is one of the greatest leverage points for increasing our collective climate resilience. And yet, the women who step forward time and time again to prevent environmental degradation and injustice, um, the, the aunties, the grandmothers, the mothers, the sisters, they face um, a an incredible uphill battle. Their bodies and health are threatened, their work is under-resourced and their leadership is stymied. So for WIA, in partnership with both global and national organizations and networks, we co-design capacity building trainings where these leaders are able to access technology, financing, mentorship, and that global alliance I mentioned. Um, and we do this because we believe that when women thrive, the earth thrives. Uh, it's, it's really that simple and that profound. Um, when, we, when women's leadership is recognized, respected, centered, and amplified, we see that children are safer, communities are healthier, natural resources regenerate, local economies prosper, regions stabilize, and, and real lasting transformation can take root. Um, so thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, Kaheo, for that. So Kay, Tell us about Ripple Africa. Hi, Nina. Thank you so much for having me. What an honor to be here. Um, well, Ripple Africa is a grassroots, not-for-profit organization. And we're working in Malawi, which is this small little country that you see located here in southeastern Africa. But before I dive into Ripple Africa, I'd just really like to share a few things about the country that provide some background for the work that we do. This country is very densely populated with just under 19 million people calling Malawi home. 85% of these people live in rural areas, much like the setting that you see pictured here. Malawi is considered one of the poorest countries in the world with the average income just over $1 a day. And a vast majority of Malawians are subsistent farmers who are growing food upon which their family needs for survival, and most often women are the ones responsible for tending to these crops. So who are we and what do we do? Well, since 2004, we've worked alongside the Malawian community to come up with sustainable um, solutions to the issues that they, the people, have identified as the most pressing. Next slide, please. So in response to these pressing issues, we have a variety of small scale education and healthcare initiatives in and around our base in Northern Malawi. Next slide. In addition, we run several large scale environmental projects which span across four districts. And several of these projects really focus on mitigating the negative impact that severe deforestation and subsequent climate change has had on the country. And it's these environmental projects that I'm gonna focus my time on here tonight. Next slide. So there are several factors causing widespread deforestation in Malawi. I've already mentioned one, and that is the very large and very rapidly growing population. Next slide, please. It's also important to understand that this is a population who is just hugely dependent on wood for survival. In fact, 95% of Malawi's people rely on wood for everyday cooking, with the majority of them cooking on three stone fires just like this. Each of these fires consumes three to four bundles of wood per week, like you see here, which is contributing greatly to Malawi's deforestation problems. As one of Malawi's most urgent concerns, we are addressing deforestation using a very multifaceted approach. Next slide. 
one of which is to protect Malawi's existing forests from further destruction. And we start off by educating the local community on the importance of protecting our forests. And then we work in partnership with these communities and the district government staff to protect the forest from the legal practice of cutting down the trees in the designated forest areas. Next slide. So currently we are working with over 17 forest conservation committee members um, who patrol these forests to safeguard them. And the good news is that with these protective measures in place, these forests will regenerate over time. So in addition to protecting the forest, we also replenish the much needed trees to meet the demand for cooking and building that our population needs. Um, we need to provide a sustainable source for them to cook and to build. And that's why it's very important that we have pre tree planting projects. We work with community groups, local farmers, schools, and individuals, and we provide them with the equipment, the training, and the support needed for planting and growing trees as a sustainable source of firewood and timber. By doing so, the need to cut down the trees in these forest areas have, have been eliminated virtually. To date, we have planted over 17 million trees, and we have plans to continue these efforts to address the tremendous demand for wood. And finally, we're constantly looking for ways to reduce Malawi's reliance on wood. And as a result, we have introduced a very simple, inexpensive, fuel-efficient cook stove that really reduces the need for firewood by two thirds. It's also safer because of its enclosed design and it produces less smoke. The stove itself is really easy to make and the homeowner is involved in the process so she knows exactly how to maintain it long term. To date, we have built almost 50,000 stoves with Together Women Rise, providing the funding for 9,000 of these. Altogether, this project is saving a staggering total of 94,000 bundles of wood each and every week. And this is helping us to curb deforestation considerably in this country. Next slide. So if you'd like to find out any more details about these projects that I just talked about, or possibly some of Ripple Africa's other projects in Malawi's, I invite you to visit our website at rippleafrica.org to learn more. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. Thank you so much to all the panelists for giving us such a wonderful overview of all their projects in their different countries with different populations. Um, almost all of you work in different countries that have different resources. Some are middle-income countries, some are low-income countries but the communities that you work in are fairly diverse. So can you explain how the intersectionality of gender, race, class, sexuality, caste, and ethnicity play out in these communities that you work with? Share some of the projects, share some of your successes and challenges, and hey, I'm going to go to you first. Thank you. Um... Intersectionality is a huge part of our work. Um, and the thing, the, the, the project really that comes to mind is, is actually here in the US um, because it's so globally, but particularly here, it's so important, this kind of growing recognition um, that climate and environmental justice isn't possible without gender justice, without racial justice, without economic justice, and without a real reckoning with our country's colonial history. Um, and that's really central to, to our theory of change. And this was highlighted for us um, in a report and toolkit we worked on in partnership with the Native Youth Sexual Health Network. Um, and that work was called the Violence on the Land, Violence in Our Bodies uh, Report and Toolkit, Building an Indigenous Response to Environmental Violence. Um, and this initiative centered the experiences and resistance efforts of indigenous women and young people in order to expose and curtail the impacts of extractive industries on their communities and their lands, but also just on their bodies, very real on their bodies and on their lives. Um, and this dangerous intersection of extractive industry, 
the violence that accompanies it, um, the population of women and young people who are already targets of systemic violence and generational trauma um, really set the stage for increased violence on the land leading to increased violence on indigenous women and young people. And what the years of that work and the conversations had with community members, elders and leaders showed us is the deep intersectional nature of environmental violence. The higher levels of cancers, birth defects, miscarriages and mental illnesses and its impact on the social fabric of indigenous communities living near industrial developments. Um, the ways that extractive industry fueled by corporate and governmental uh, greed really furthers colonial and patriarchal systems by eroding traditional indigenous governance systems and the role of women in these communities. Um, and it also reconfirmed why we work with grassroots women um, because indigenous women in frontline communities are still leading efforts to resist the erasure of their people um, in, in spite of the onslaught of you know, assaults on and disregard for their traditions, lands and people Indigenous women, two-spirit people, young people are continuing to gather, strategize and heal. They're weaving together the intersecting issues of indigenous sovereignty, environmentalism, feminism, reproductive health, youth rights and anti-colonialism. And what that work was born out of, I think, is an ongoing challenge in, in our collective movement and that's the siloing of our issues. Um, things are, are, are changing in recent years, we're seeing that, um, but still so often we continue to see women's issues over here, clean energy folks over here, racial justice over here, climate mitigation over here, as if those things are separate issues. Um, and that's why spaces like this panel are so important. You know, these are complicated issues. So in our work, we recognize the need to complicate the work and the conversation too. Thank you, thank you, Kahea. And this brings me to a reminder to all of us that the tagline for Together Women Rise is Collective Action for Global Gender Equality. Yes, all of us here in this session, we need to talk about this and then we need to move on to action. So Ashley, um, Health and Harmony also works in, with indigenous communities, both in Indonesia and now in Brazil. Uh, tell us more about it. Yeah, thanks so much, Vina, and thanks, Kahea, for your work. It's just amazing what you all are doing. You know, when I first got this question, I said, oh, my word. You know, it's such a big question, and it's such a hard one, and it requires every one of us to, to do something. So it's dynamic, to say the very least, uh, and it's dramatically different in every place we work. And so our privilege is really being able to take a closer look and learn from rainforest communities and kind of the internal cultural pressures of you know, gender dynamics, sexuality, and responsibility are, you know, as Kahea was saying, compounded by you know, national and even international politics and policies, relationships, um, and systems that are deeply influenced by race, class, and power. Uh, all of which are built on a really long and painful history of colonization, oppression, and growth of this global market economy that doesn't serve these communities, but benefits from their drawdown and preservation of biodiversity. So at the center of all this complexity, time and time again, we often see women and girls holding the brunt of responsibility to care for their communities, not just in daily life, but also in faith and in hope. Uh, so it came as no, no surprise that when we sit in community and ask the question, what do you need from the rest of the world to be able to protect and preserve this precious rainforest that we all benefit from? One of the first requests that we hear time and time again is we need maternal and infant health care, the most basic need. Um, you know, women and girls are the backbone of these communities. Thank you, Ashley. Kay, I know you work really closely with your communities in Malawi. How does this all play out in Malawi? It's not just the environment, it's about health, it's about well being, it's so much more. That is so true. Um, you know, poverty, the environment, climate change, and gender, they're all so deeply intertwined. And with women in countries like Malawi being especially vulnerable, the social norms here dictate that women are responsible for 
all of the tasks involved with overseeing the household. And they have to do the cooking, the cleaning, the wood and water collection, childcare, food production, and so on. Subsequently, women are just very dependent on the natural resources, such as wood, in caring for their families. But wood collection can be quite the challenge for women, um, especially when they're faced with widespread deforestation. Due to the insufficient supply, um, women are forced to walk longer and longer distances to access the wood they need, which is not only extremely time consuming, but it also puts them at risk for sexual violence as they travel further and further away from home. Our fuel efficient cook stove that I mentioned previously really helps address this issue by decreasing the need for firewood by two thirds, but it also speeds up the cooking process due to the stove's design. So just in wood collection alone, the cook stove can save a woman up to 10 hours each week. Due to the widespread deforestation that's also happening in, in Malawi, you know, droughts and flooding are much more common. And these climate changes are especially difficult for women as they're often the ones who oversee the, the growing of the crops for their foods, for their family's food security and their livelihoods. So in addition to Ripple Africa's tree planting and forest conservation and, and cook stove projects that I've talked about, there are really two additional ways in which we're working to reverse climate, um, these climate changes in our area. As I mentioned repeatedly now, um, Malawi's densely populated country has put an incredible stress on its natural resources. Um, so in response to this rapidly growing population, we have a family planning and sexual health project which works with schools and community groups and couples to educate both sexes about the impact that family size has on our natural resources and livelihoods. Um, family um, planning is discussed in detail, so all of the participants have the information and the resources that are available to them to make informed decisions about their future. And then in addition to this, this project, um, we're always looking for opportunities to promote girls education, knowing the many, many benefits it has for the girl herself and the family and the community. And so one of the ways in which we have addressed this is by providing a girls dormitory at our secondary school, which gives girls the opportunity to live on site so they can really focus on school and advance their education. And we all know the studies have shown that girls who stay in school delay the onset of starting a family and usually have less children overall. So needless to say, an emphasis on girls' education has many positive outcomes, one of which is a decrease in the demand for natural resources due to the family size being smaller. Thank you, Kay. So Alicia, as I come to you and the work of UNICEF, um, you do so many different projects that cut across women's lives, but you also do uh, disaster reduction or preparation for disasters. So how does this all play out with the intersectionality? Thank you for that question. And um, so humbling to hear all the amazing work that the panelists organizations are engaged in. Uh, UNICEF is, you know, as you know, a huge organization, a UN agency, a promoter of child rights, um, and it, it does work, as you mentioned, Bina, in many different sectors. But one of the one of the things I love most about UNICEF is that they do really uh, recognize the intersectionality in terms of its impact on people, especially women and girls. So, for example, safe water means that you have a healthy community, children don't get sick, that don't, people don't get cholera, and, people, and young children in particular can get all the nourishment out of their food and, and not suffer from malnutrition. Um, and gender as a, a thematic area in UNICEF is actually a cross-cutting area that goes um, across all of, of the other areas. So um, in that sense, gender is really embedded into all the work that UNICEF does across sectors. And I, I just want to echo a couple of things that Kay said, because the example I was also going to use was girls' education, um, which is truly transformative um, 
for example, as Kay mentioned, girls who receive an education are less likely to marry young and they're more likely to lead healthy lives and earn higher incomes. And when women earn higher incomes, economies are strengthened and inequalities over time are reduced. Um, educated women can also participate more fully in uh, decisions that affect their lives, helping build better futures for their families and for themselves. And girls also need to feel safe in their classroom. So they need to be able to manage menstruation while at school and feel supported in the subjects they choose. They, want, they need to be supported in uh, pursuing STEM, STEM education, which is an area where girls are underrepresented. Uh, but we also know, even from pre-COVID data, that there's a long way to go to improve girls' education. Um, only 66% of countries have achieved gender parity in primary education, and that's 45% when it gets to secondary education. So uh, one, of the, one of the programs that UNICEF has been supporting that has been a huge success, it's a program called Techno Girl in South Africa. It's a, a, a program that places high school girls from underprivileged communities into STEM related companies for a three year internship. And girls do job shadowing, they take part in mentorship workshops and skills development programs, and it helps them learn STEM uh, related skills and gain experience that they can use later in their professional lives. So in all these ways, UNICEF continues to you know, focus on girls' education for the future and enacts uh, gender, a gender focus, a gender lens in all its work across all of its goal areas. Thank you. I believe our panelists are seeing some of the questions that the audience is kind of putting out there for all of you. And perhaps we can address that at the end of this panel, we can um, get, gather some questions from the audience and the panelists will answer them. So keep your questions coming. Um, Kelly and Mansi will be keeping an eye on that. Moving on to something that all of us have been experiencing in this past year. Climate change we know is altering the way we interact with our environment and to other species on earth. This COVID-19 pandemic has been such a stark reminder of what happens when the delicate balance is disrupted. We are also hearing of the huge large scale impact on the lives of women and girls, setting us back in advancements in everything that all of you have talked about, about education, about health and so many other advancements that we have made. So if you could address each one of you about the impact of COVID in your communities, and I'm going to call on Ashley first, because Health in Harmony has talked about how when you destroy environments, a pandemic is what happens. Yeah, thanks so much, Vina. So, you know, working at the intersection of human and environmental health through a, a planetary health approach, um, we, see coronavirus as the emergency inside the emergency um, as we continue to destroy nature and the climate crisis. Uh, it gives global heating momentum. Uh, and we think this is probably the first of many climate shocks we'll feel. Um, so in the process of leveraging an emergency infectious disease response with our frontline medical staff, We've also developed uh, things like rainforest stimulus packages um, as an alternative to what we saw in our first stimulus package here in the US, which was a bailout for oil and gas, a bailout for airplanes. You know, these are not things that are gonna help stave off future shocks. We need to bolster the resilience of rainforest communities and the rainforest themselves, which you know, we can see in the Amazon and so many other parts of the world are in flames. Um, and so, it's really for us about prevention and doing that through, again, the brilliance and science of indigenous communities who steward over 85% of the most uh, biodiverse, high conservation value rainforests uh, and do it incredibly well. So our, our healthcare provision reduces degradation um, and alternative livelihoods regenerate nature through organic farming and backyard nurseries and agroforestry. Um, and as you saw in that picture, you know, communities are designing their own interventions. So during the crisis, as we saw a lot of our contemporaries in the classic conservation field slow down and get 
um, paralyzed by COVID because communities were saying to them, we don't need trees right now, we need healthcare. Um, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of organizations, again, to deconstruct this very siloed approach to classic development aid, which comes from you know, a very North uh, Western perspective um, to think more intersectionally about it, to think more um, comprehensively about it. Um, so for us, it sped us up and we launched programs during COVID and we did it through believing in and trusting communities. And I think so often in development and so often in this work, it's, oh, we have to send people from the North you know, to the global South to be able to fix something or be on the ground and manage this. That's just not true. You know, there's, there's really amazing people and institutions in these countries that we've been able to leverage to respond to this emergency and respond to it well. Again, not just um, the immediate COVID emergency, but the long-term effects of this. Um, one great example that I love so much was the COVID stimulus package in Indonesia. So farmers and small business owners, like so many people here, their businesses are shut down, they're cut off from their usual distribution networks uh, and they're struggling. And so what would you do if your family got COVID or you were struggling? I would go to my back room and pick up my chainsaw and go cut down some trees to make some money. So we did just a very quick basic risk analysis of who's most likely to re-engage in logging, who most needs this stimulus support. And we looked at you know, people who had chainsaws, former loggers, business owners, and farmers. And then we just set up uh, nurseries in their backyards to cultivate seedlings. We trained them in cultivation, and then we bought their seedlings. And then for, farmer, for farmers, we just purchased their produce to feed people in the communities who were most vulnerable. Um, and again, you know, these are oftentimes women that are running a lot of these businesses and supporting a lot of these programs and supporting the most vulnerable. So we want to see more of these types of stimulus packages. We want, you know, this little story to be a big story because these are the type of um, sustainable approaches that are needed versus band-aid approaches, which, which is what we so often see. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Alicia, can you address uh, UNICEF's projects? I mean, um, the big one is the two billion doses of vaccine through COVAX. So the so the big the big projects as well as the little ones in addressing COVID nineteen. Absolutely, thank you, Vina. Um, as Vina mentioned, UNICEF is a big part of the global collaboration that's called Act A or Access to COVID nineteen Tools Accelerator. It's uh, Act A is accelerating the development, production, and equitable access to COVID-19 tests, treatments, and vaccines. And UNICEF was asked to lead on procuring and delivering vaccines uh, for 92 low-income countries and to serve as a vaccine procurement lead and coordinator for more than 90 high-income countries. UNICEF was chosen for this role because it has the largest vaccine procurement, storage, shipping, cold chain, and supply network um, in the whole world, along with a strong on the ground presence already doing program and advocacy work in more than 150 countries. So um, in the first two weeks of the vaccine rollout, uh, at least 28 million doses of uh, COVID-19 vaccine were delivered to 32 countries. UNICEF is also um, on the more micro level um, bringing its risk communication and community engagement expertise to the COVID uh, pandemic response. So this is the work that's done in the communities to help increase uh, the demand and acceptance of vaccines through uh, various different types of uh, communication, everything from posters um, to social media pitches, uh, but also on the micro level, uh, UNICEF is really uh, even though it has a very critical role to play in the global vaccine response and um, testing and treatment, they're still working extremely hard to ensure that the continuity of services for routine healthcare, like immunizing children, um, education, uh, all the creative ways that they've been supporting education around the world, nutrition, et cetera, uh, they're still making sure that they don't sacrifice those areas that are so critical to uh, the long-term impact that this, this year, this pandemic has been having on children 
communities and the future of all those countries. Thank you so much, um, Alicia. There's so much to be done. There's the macro level and at the micro level. So Kahea, can you tell us what's going on in the uh, WEA communities? Yeah, of course. Um, with the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw that the burden on women overall in the communities we work at became magnified, especially for those living in under-resourced regions where accessing food, fuel, and safe water was already a daily challenge. Um, not to mention, women are also shouldering the brunt of the COVID crisis as frontline healthcare workers, essential workers on farms, schools, factories, grocery stores, and as caregivers at home. We as programming, because we work with grassroots women, is designed to be quite nimble and responsive to what's happening on the ground. Um, so we were able to pivot based on the needs our Alliance leaders were sharing with us. Um, they have critical knowledge about which communities are being reached by aid and how to reach them, which roads were closed, what government officials to call, which refugee camps are understaffed. Um, and we knew that, you know, after discussion with our partners, we knew that we needed to implement urgently needed relief efforts in tandem with program that, programs that build ongoing food, health, and safety solutions. So together we designed a two-prong strategy to one, keep people safe in the last year, and two, to create food, water, and health solutions that feed and protect communities into the long-term. So we worked with our partners in Indonesia, here in the US and in India to launch food distribution programs, um, ways to check in and care for elders um, and to ensure that they have food, um, providing clean water um, and, and soap making trainings, creating mutual aid and ensuring that women and children were in those ways staying safe. Um, in Kenya in particular, our longtime partner uh, with women in water and natural resource conservation immediately sprung into action with us after the pandemic really hit their community, um, transforming their small office into a distribution center um, and providing food and supplies to those who needed it most in, um, in, their, in their larger community. And the co-founder of, of that organization, uh, Rose, she also is now coordinating our ongoing COVID and climate resilience program um, with our networks of local women climate leaders who are already well-versed in disaster response, um, water sanitation hygiene, and in climate smart agriculture. Um, and that program, that ongoing um, COVID and climate resilience program has a number of interventions that we're offering, including building distribution channels to provide emergency food supplies and sanitation and hygiene packages to households and and to also to the evacuees at the time who were living in local schools, um, providing wash services that focused on safe water, face masks and hand washing, and working with our network of trained women wash masons and builders to construct storage tanks, biosan water filters, tippy tap stations, VIP toilets and rainwater harvesting systems, um, as well as launching tree planting enterprises in desertified and drop from regions across the country, which also are providing economic security for a lot of women in the long term, um, and uh, is is serving as a immediate climate response too. Gosh, all your stories are so wonderful to hear. You are all doing all of the above. It's just a difference in scale and what you can do. This, these stories are so heartening. Um, Kay, what about Malawi? We recently heard that COVID cases were rising in Malawi. So what's happening in your communities? Well, Malawi does face enormous healthcare challenges. Um, their services are extremely limited and in rural areas is pretty much non-existent. So you can imagine that the threat of COVID-19 has been a huge concern. Luckily, Malawi was very proactive from the beginning. Um, they shut down the country before its first case was even reported. Um, and the urban areas did a great job of getting the message out about the virus. However, these messages really weren't reaching um, our rural populations. So we initially suspended all of our projects and we kind of leapt into action, utilizing our extensive network of environmental volunteers to really help us get the word out in the four districts where we work. 
So we funded a public awareness um, campaign and distributed over 30,000 leaflets just to educate the rural villagers about how the disease is transmitted and how they can protect themselves and their family against COVID. In addition, we supplied 200 buckets with taps and soap to health care centers and community meeting places to really encourage people to wash their hands regularly. Something as basic as just soap is something they don't have. And it was during these efforts that we discovered that um, there were hundreds of broken boreholes and wells in our area and that this was really causing an overcrowding at the ones that were in working order. And this made social distancing nearly impossible. So our team pivoted and, and really got to work and repaired 340 of these to provide better access and less crowding when women go to collect the water. So after briefly pausing our projects for this COVID awareness campaign, um, I'm happy to say that all of our projects have resumed. Um, the educational projects took a little bit longer because school was out two different times, um, but we are fully in operations um, with safe practices now in place to um, avoid transmission. And despite an uptick in the cases this past January, you know, what you were referring to, Malawi really by all accounts appears to have been able to keep the virus under control as much as we can tell. Again, the, the testing there isn't, you know, what it is elsewhere. Um, and we don't have a super accurate idea of COVID deaths. Um, but I think if we see a huge spike from one year to another, we're going to know. Um, but for, by all appearances, it does seem that the virus has been under control, thankfully. Um, the country has just launched a vaccination um, program. However, the real challenge is going to be getting that, that those vaccinations to our rural communities. So it's very likely that it'll be quite some time before the country will be really fully protected. Yes, uh, we are all waiting for that day. Uh, thank you, Kay. My next question is slightly different. All of us on this panel play a role in collective action for women and girls. Together Women Rise as a philanthropic organization is able to mobilize funding from our donors in small modest amounts where the donations and our funding of our partners, it is a voice. We stand for something. We're making a statement. And in a sense, it is a somewhat of a political act. Here we are at CSW 65. This is also making a statement, however small, however loud. Some of you work with governments and you work with advocacy groups and your voice may have to be far louder, firmer, or perhaps you're doing a little bit of a delicate dance. Tell us more about this work that you have to do in negotiating with governments and policymakers and you know, the corridors of power um, tell us about your policy work. And I'm going to ask um, UNICEF to start us off. So Alicia. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, UNICEF, you know, being operating in so many countries around the world, um, it partners most, it, its main partner is the government wherever it works. In fact, it, it is only able to operate where invited by the national government. Um, and UNICEF is non-political as an organization. And by that, what I mean is that UNICEF is there to advocate for the rights of children. So um, whether that's in Myanmar or you know, um, a, um, a, a country where obviously there are things that are going on that uh, the world is kind of looking at um, all over the world, it doesn't matter what the government is about because a child is a child and a child, if a child needs support, that is what UNICEF is there for. So um, we have a thing we like to call suits and boots. UNICEF um, has boots on the ground and does uh, uh, the implementing work along with partners on the ground, but also has the seat at the table with governments uh, working over 75 years in this space. Uh, UNICEF has proved itself to be a valuable partner to governments 
And so we have that sort of seat at the table to advocate for children's rights. So for example, you know, over time, UNICEF has been able to pivot from exclusively kind of focusing on this, like building infrastructure, like in the water space, uh, let's say building latrines at schools, to, to being to advocating with governments so that over time they will increase their resources to um, waste management, to sanitation solutions that can be scaled at the national level, which is how they're sustained over the long term. Um, and just at bringing it back down to the community level, UNICEF works with uh, women in communities in the wash space in particular um, on the design and delivery of water sanitation and hygiene systems, including through ensuring that women are uh, represented on local water committees that maintain and manage the water points. So these committees provide opportunities for skill development, leadership, and financial empowerment for women. Uh, and uh, just as a, you know, a plug for ourselves as a community of, of women um, and, and allies, I think one thing we can do um, to kind of keep, the, keep, keep um, the focus going in this direction is to make sure, you know, we, we used to call them man panels, you know, where you would speak on a panel and there would be one woman and she was like given the token moderator um, position, but just to make sure that we don't participate in those. Like we, as a community, we can, we can try to uh, advocate for equity in that regard as well. And, and, and here in the US, you know, we have a voice too. We can hold our elected leaders accountable and we can um, in, make sure that we, we get the lasting policy change on gender equity issues ourselves here at home as well. Thank you. Well said. Yeah. Um, Ashley, do you want to tell us about some of your policy work? Yeah, I'd love to. So we always work alongside governments, subnational leadership, uh, ministries of health and environment, um, wherever we work. And our, ultimately, we hope that they adopt this sector agnostic approach to human and environmental health. Um, and also deconstruct their siloed approach to funding interventions and policies. Um, a nice initiative we're part of here in the US that's really focused on this new administration uh, is called Preventing Pandemics at Source. And they have um, a coalition letter going around now, uh, which you can sign on to. Uh, and it's an initiative that is really building alliances and influencing the US government to prevent the next pandemic. Um, another great organization that we're involved with is GCHA, Global Climate and Health Alliance. Um, and they're really focused on um, enacting the next generation of change agents, bringing together women, leaders, and medical professionals in particular to really engage in addressing the climate crisis, knowing that they have um, a lot of power and opportunity to do so. Um, but you know, we're very fortunate that our former executive director at ASRI, our sister site in Indonesia, uh, is now the right hand uh, to the COVID czar in that country. And so she's very much bringing a planetary health approach to the response to COVID there, which is wonderful. Um, and then in Brazil right now, you know, our entire team is caught up in um, advocacy around trying to get a lockdown. The COVID cases are higher than they've ever been. Um, the hospitals are completely full and they're looking at what happened in Manaus a couple weeks ago, a potential collapse of their healthcare system, uh, which is devastating. And so a lot of their work is with the local mayor and advocacy and pushing again for the rights of indigenous and traditional people who are not, not necessarily in the urban area, but won't have access to it if there's no beds and no resources for them to, to access. So lots to do and lots of opportunity. Lots to do, and I'm sure that our entire audience is itching to go. So Kay, tell us more about some of your policy work at Ripple Africa. Sure. One of our strengths is that we work in partnership with Malawi's government departments, the district councilors, the senior chiefs, the villages, basically the entire community to really identify the needs that are the most urgent and important. So input from all of these various people are really vital um, in finding solutions, which are simple 
cost-effective and maintainable. And women are very much included in this process as they have so much knowledge and experience, especially as it relates to environmental issues. And as the ones most impacted by these issues, their voices and their participation really, really crucial to finding and implementing sustainable solutions that result in long-term impactful change. And it's for this reason that our projects have women positioned in key roles. And quite frankly, we attribute much of our success to their involvement and participation. But you know, change is really slow in patriarchal countries like Malawi, especially in regards to gender equity. But what we're doing is really working hard to change attitudes by demonstrating through the success of our projects that women are key to overcoming our country's challenges, especially environmental and climate change problems. But despite the gains that we're witnessing at the local level, there's still so much to do with gender equality in Malawi, and especially in regards to land rights and equal access to resources and decision-making. Thank you, Kay. Kahea, why don't you give us what WEA has been doing? So a lot of our, I mean, a majority of our work, our entire work is really done in partnership with our local partners and we really allow them to take the lead. So any sort of advocacy work we are involved in is largely the advocacy work they're involved in. Um, and our role is really to amplify and to support their message. So whatever that may be from um, sacred site protection to uh, and like, uh, opposing pipelines going through indigenous communities um, to getting far uh, women farmers recognized in certain communities. Um, if our partners, if our grassroots partners come to us and say that that is something they're working on and can we help, then that's when we get involved. We also get involved with larger policy here in the United States as it pertains to coalition building. So things like the feminist Green New Deal, for example, we, we join in in partnership and in coalition with a lot of our sister organizations to do that kind of work because we do believe like there's strength in numbers and we are all bringing such important work and experience and knowledge to the table. And for many years, um, we ran a program, we housed a program um, called the North America Advocacy Network where we facilitated um, legal and policy and business collaborations between grassroots indigenous women leaders here in the United States with pro bono legal support. And that was around things like water protection, um, sacred site protection, um, working on you know, EPA briefs and things like that. So, so really our work in the policy realm has to do largely with what the community is asking us for, what grassroots, grassroots women leaders are asking us to support them on. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kaya, for all of that wonderful work, both here and, uh, and abroad in the Global South. So I'm moving now into our last question for the panel. And once they have all answered uh, the, this question, we will move to questions from the audience that will be moderated by Mansi and Kelly. Uh, after which Beth Ellen will give us some closing remarks. And we do expect to uh, end the session well before the 9 p.m. allotted time. So hang in there, everybody. Um, so let's go in for this last question. So a lot of you have brought this up talking about young people. And so young people and the youth is my, what my question is going to be about. The youth across the world have clearly indicated that they want a stake and they have a stake in their own futures. They want big issues like climate change to be addressed. Here at CSW65 and at uh, the Gender Equality Forum, at Beijing Plus 25, in the halls of the United Nations, young people are pushing and pushing. They are pushing us to do more. How are all of you engaging the next generation to become the change agents? And how can all of us in this session help you do this? So Kahe, I'm coming back to you for this one. Can you go first? Yes, wonderful. Um, so our accelerator model and our accelerator programs 
Um, we have accelerators in Kenya, we have them in the United States, um, and that's a Sierra Club partnership. And then we have our accelerator program in Indonesia. And these programs have been running for um, several years now, but we run several accelerators each year in the various locations. Um, they are one of the ways that we get to really work with and support the leadership of young people who are stepping forward in our movements. Um, for example, in our accelerators here in the US, the cohorts are very intentionally selected so that there are, there's a mix um, and there, uh, an age mix and there can be a knowledge exchange between young leaders and elders. We've had leaders, very, very powerful leaders as young as 15 years old um, join our cohorts. And it's been so incredible to see the opportunities created through these programs for a natural mentorship to arise. Um, I think it's been incredibly helpful to have leaders who have devoted their lives to these causes share strategies and not just strategies around the work, but around self and community care, which is really inseparable um, to share those strategies with those who are just on the cusp of devoting their lives to these causes. So I would say um, one way to support this for us is to help us get the word out about, the, about these accelerator programs. You know, we are really um, looking to include young leaders in there who, who have uh, solutions who have climate initiatives that um, they're prepared, they're ready for ampli amplification, for deepening their impact. Um, each year we open applications for the next accelerator cohort and we rely so much on our community of sister organizations to help us reach leaders from within their networks who are looking for resources and support to deepen the impact of, of their work. Um, so that's, yeah, that's our, what we're doing. Oh, you're muted, Vina. <laughs> Zoom is telling me I'm muted. So thank you, Kay. So Kay, um, what is the message for the youth and how can we help? Well, in Malawi, um, over 50% of the population is under the age of 18. So engaging the next generation is just so vital. The bottom line is if action is not taken immediately, it's their futures really are at grave risk. Therefore, our projects um, really have an educational component, which involves our teams visiting the local schools to really create awareness about how students are personally and collectively impacting the environment, and then offering practical ways through our projects in which they can help alter this trend. Um, as I've mentioned, we're also focusing on the topic of population with this group and showing the connection that family size has to many of the issues that Malawians face. Um, and the projects that we've discussed already are the family planning and self-sexual health project, which really is linking family size to overall health and well-being. And then the emphasis on girls' education with our girls' dormitory which is giving girls the opportunity to succeed in school by living on site. Um, so, but beyond Malawi, it's our hope that this next generation will really continue their pursuit as change agents by advocating for and creating innovative ways to lessen our carbon footprint and really cut that excessive consumption that we all take part in so we can all live greener and cleaner. Um, we invite them and all of you to really look for ways to support the efforts of grassroots climate change projects, such as maybe Ripple Africa's uh, through donations or volunteering. Um, please feel free to check out our website um, so that you can learn about the ways you can partner with us, um, including how to offset your carbon footprint through the planting the trees, building cook stoves, and other, other efforts that protect the natural resources that are just so vital to everyday life in this country. Yep. Thank you, Kay. And I also want to remind the audience that Ripple Africa does get carbon credits for the wonderful work it does. So it's kind of an, um, a nonprofit earning money for all the good work that they do. You can do it in so many different ways, which is such a wonderful idea. Um, and so Ashley, what about uh, Health and Harmony? Yeah, you know, for us too, the youth are the planeteers, right? They're not the planeteers of the future, they're the planeteers of now. 
Um, and so we have a number of youth education programs, but um, for us, it's really about listening to youth, listen to them, believe in their solutions, continue to amplify their voices. Um, they are and will be suffering from these anthropogenic effects of climate change, and we owe it to them to value their engagement and respect their experience. Eco-anxiety is really compounded by natural disaster and biodiversity collapse. Um, and these are just overwhelming realities for young people. Um, and in particular, I just encourage us to listen to indigenous girls. Um, Gia Batida, a youth activist from Mexico, tells us from her culture and her perspective, and I wanna quote her because it's beautiful. Um, she says, we don't call water a resource. We call it a sacred element. The relationship we have with everything that earth offers is about reciprocity. And that's the only way that we're going to learn how to shift our culture from an extraction culture to one that is balanced and harmonious and a culture with the land. Thank, thank you, Ashley. Um, yes, we should be listening to young people and uh, listen to the issues that they bring up and hear their voices. So Alicia, I'm going to give you the last word on this panel. Uh, UNICEF focuses on children. UNICEF focuses on youth. You have an annual youth summit where young people actually control the agenda. Yes, thank you so much. The last word on youth for UNICEF, that's great. Um, and thank you so much to, to all the panelists, um, to everyone for joining and to especially Together Women, uh, Together Women Rise for your longstanding partnership with us uh, and all the impact that you have helped make for children and girls around the world. Um, as we saw like in my very wordy slide in the beginning, um, Engaging youth as agents of change is part of UNICEF's strategic plan. It's part of UNICEF's DNA. And just like Ashley said, listening to youth and amplifying their voices, that's an essential part of what UNICEF is all about. Uh, so we, we know, for example, um, that children who are taught the importance of hand washing with soap at school, they bring that knowledge back home and they teach it to their families, they teach it to their communities. And over time, the health of those communities is improved. Um, and I just want to talk about one um, example of a program that UNICEF has been engaged in for a while. It's called the Climate Ambassadors Program in Zambia. And this is a program that partners with young people to talk about and address the impacts of climate change in Zambia. So climate ambassadors receive training on environmental conservation and advocacy so they can impact government climate change programs for sustainability. And the project started in 2010. And since then, UNICEF has helped provide training for more than 1,500 climate ambassadors there, planted more than 30,000 trees in 210 schools, implemented 13 adaptation projects that have resulted in cleaner and greener schools, and started recycling at 475 schools. Uh, but we also have started a really um, kind of a brand new domestic program as well at UNICEF USA. Uh, we have what we call UNICEF Unite, and we have uh, youth, high school youth and, and college campus clubs, um, and they uh, engage in advocacy through a collective action like at our youth summit and also throughout the year, education and advocacy. And we'd love for you to come check out um, their work. It's on our website, which is unicefusa.org backslash unite. Thank you. Thank you. So that officially ends the formal part of our panel. Uh, I would like to pass this on to Mansi and Kelly to moderate the questions for the panel from the chat from our, all the audience. Great, thank you so much, Vina. I just want to note on behalf of Ashley, she had to she had to leave earlier, and she apologizes for that and asked me to share that with you. We also have her email address, so if you wish to connect with her directly, um, we'll be sure to add that into the chat. So the first question that we received um, is a question actually is for Kay. Um, is there any way solar power can be used to reduce the CO two producing fuel? 
We have used um, solar panel at our base um, at Ripple Africa um, quite effectively. And honestly, in the areas in which we're working, um, there's not really electricity. Um, and so um, we're working on getting some of the electricity there, but the solar panels, the issue becomes as, as they break, um, they're the parts and, and the things that are needed to fix them aren't readily available. Um, so we really try to work on sustainable solutions that are very low cost, easy to maintain. And solar, we would love to get into it more and we feel like there's a lot of value, especially because of the climate there. However, um, you know, there are a lot of cost obstacles that we need to be able to overcome to be able to, to use that on a wide scale. Great, thank you so much, Kay. Um, our next question, I'm gonna open it up really to all the panelists. And I know there was a question about the COVID-19 pandemic, but really, are there any lessons that have been learned from the COVID-19 pandemic in, ta in tackling the climate crisis? Um, so just opening that up to everyone. <laughs> Uh, Kelly, I can take a stab at that. Um, I, I would say one thing that the pandemic has really shown us is that there is a huge need for cooperation um, across countries, across governments, across sectors, and, and really showing that what affects uh, one of us is going to affect all of us. And climate is the exact same thing. We, we're not going to clean up the, in, the, uh, the environment in country A and have country B be safe. Mm -hmm. So if there's one thing that we can take away from this uh, craziness uh, that we're all going through as a human family, uh, maybe it's that we have to be able to work together and come up with uh, solutions together. Thank you. Um. I think for WIA, what, what kind of was brought to light with the crisis was the need for us all to consider the quite one dimensional um, support. You know, when we were talking with our partners, they were, their countries were getting aid, um, but the aid would not get, could not get to the communities. Um, for various reasons, whether or not that's government corruption, whether or not that was closed roads, whether or not that was a locust outbreak. Um, so really the need to not just do one kind of support with aid, but also to, to have long-term community building, like community capacity building programs in tandem. Um, and, and ideally those will also be climate safe and, and, and climate mitigating responses as well. Great, thank you. And Vina Beth Allen, I'll take uh, my cues from you in terms of when you want to kind of wrap up and say your closing remarks. I'll also note that just in case we don't get to your questions, we'll be able to follow up with you afterwards and share them via our platform as well. So the next question that we have here is, again, I think this could be for all panelists. Why is partnership so important? Um, what is, why is collective impact instrumental for climate change and gender equity? I can go. Okay, do, do you wanna go? You look like you wanted to answer, okay. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think I've said this multiple times throughout this panel, so I don't want to sound a bit like a broken record, but partnerships are so important because communities are the ones who understand what is happening to them. They understand how severe the impacts are. They understand what the impacts are. And because they are living daily with those impacts, they have the best idea for what can relieve those burdens, what kind of support they need. And so all of our work has to be done in partnership. Um, and this was, um, I think, an answer to a slightly different question, but it's, but it's kind of in, in um, dovetails very nicely. 
uh, around why partnering with women. Um, and for us, it's because women have their finger on the pulse of, of a lot of these resources, food, fuel, um, water. And if you don't engage women, you don't often provide the kinds of need that the community has. You may build a well very, very close to the village. And then a year later, you realize no one's using the well because the women use the time to travel the short, like not a long distance, but the distance to the well for their time together without the husbands, without the men. Um, they use that time for their own, you know, friendship building and community building and no one consulted them. So they're not gonna use the well in the middle of the village. They still wanna walk so they can have that private time. And so that's why for us partnerships are so important. Well, I would just like to add, you know, I think Together Women Rise is a perfect example of partnerships. Um, we have felt as a featured grantee and now as a sustained grantee that um, they weren't just our funders, you know, that they are our partners. Um, and the, the community that came along with that and reaching out to you individually has just been an incredible uh, partnership that giving. And we are very, very thankful for that. Great, thank you. This next question is um, the focus on uplifting women leadership, especially locally and indigenous women. How are you working to promote the leadership of girls or how, how are you doing this through your organizations and environmental programs? Let me rephrase that. How are you working to promote, how is your organization working to promote the leadership of girls? Or do you think that this is something that other organizations and environmental programs should do? And uh, say something about that. Um, Juna said, I mean, we talked a little bit about, um, I feel like I'm hearing myself echo. Do I still sound okay? Okay, perfect. Um, so, so we talked a little bit about one of the UNICEF programs that focuses on um, girls empowerment, uh, the one in Madagascar. UNICEF is a big part of um, you know, generation equality and works with UN women on all kinds of projects for uh, girls empowerment skills building. We talked about STEM, um, the importance of, of making sure girls can get involved in fields of, of study of their choice where they may be underrepresented. So this is an area where UNICEF is really trying to, to take the lead as a, a cross sectoral organization working at the UN and trying to uh, make sure that, that girls are, are given the opportunities to attend and stay in secondary education and build those skills, um, especially skills for the 21st century, greener skills, solar energy, and so on. Thank you. Great, I guess we'll go to the next question. Um, so again, kind of opening up to the panelists as well of when planning projects, how do you ensure that local women are given a seat at the table? So for example, if they're, you know, building wells or toilets, um, you know, is this a requirement tied into the project? I'd love to open it up to each of you. For, for us, I wouldn't say that it, it's a requirement, but it's it's um, something that we want to do because we've seen when women are placed in the key positions um, over projects that we have, that those projects tend to be much more successful. And by doing so, I, like I, I go back to what I said before, that it, that we really, I think, are changing attitudes. And so the men are seeing women as their equals and they're seeing how productive and successful they are. Um, other women are seeing that, so more and more are wanting to get involved. So it's not something that you know we mandate that we have to have so many women. It's just been something that has evolved very naturally and with the success um, is happening. 
Um, and for Women's Earth Alliance, and this kind of answers the previous question too, all of our programming is women-centered. Um, women's environmental leadership and women's environment, women's climate leadership is, is centered in all of our work. So for us, um, it, it really is a requirement um, for, you know, if all of our programming is in partnership with a local CBO, um, a, a community-based organization, and those organizations are women-led. And so for us, there's never a risk that the women aren't part of the decision-making process and aren't brought to the table when deciding things like, are we going to, where are we, you know, building a well, who is going to build it? We are going to be working with the women, a, a women-led organization in the community to train women leaders in the community to do that work and to be able to see that work through um, in the long term as well. I could just add really quickly, um, you know, for UNICEF, uh, we know that women are often the frontline healthcare workers in communities. They they know who's having you know who's who's having a baby who needs uh, postnatal support. Uh, they're also um, trained in household treatment and storage of water because uh, women in most many countries are are tasked with fetching and 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 having water for their families as we've been discussing. Um, so. It's not a requirement for UNICEF, but it is sort of embedded into uh, the DNA and the process of the equity approach that UNICEF uses, which is to lift up the most vulnerable and marginalized. And of course, that um, includes uh, women in many cases. Well, thank you so much. I'm mindful of time. Vina Beth Allen, do you think we have time for one more question? Or would you like yeah. to wrap up? Yes. One, really one more quick. question. One more question, yeah, one more. Okay, great. So this will be our last question. Um, and it is again for all panelists. How do you work in ensuring that women environmental defenders are protected from any harm, especially in a state where space for civil societies are shrinking? For example, the Philippines ranked second deadliest country in the world for people defending the environment. Um, for our work, we fortunately haven't had any of our women leaders um, in a position where their lives were in danger because of their advocacy work. Um, oftentimes the surrounding environment, the civil unrest can put them in danger. And in those cases, we always take cues from um, our, our partners on the ground, the women-led CBOs, the, train, uh, the women leaders who are participating in any program themselves. Um, if we have to shift timing of things, whatever that is, um, what sort of supports do, do they need? Do they need um, resources to be able to you know, work from home so they're not traveling on roads that are dangerous, whatever the case may be. But in terms of environmental defenders being targeted, we've luckily, none of our women leaders have been um, targets of that kind of violence yet. So we haven't come across that issue in our work as of this time. And hopefully we are able as a global community to change things so that we never come across that in our work. You know, much of what we do is that we get um, the community involvement, we, we get their buy-in because we go back to, they're the ones that are pointing out what the issues are and what they want help in achieving and overcoming. And our model for like the, the forest conservation um, and the tree planting, we have a fish conservation project because our lake is overfished because they're taking malaria, um, the, the nets, and they're stringing them together and they're fishing in the lake and subsequently all of the, the fish have disappeared. So basically it's, it's helping people and women to be empowered to know that they do have a voice and they do have a right to, to stop behaviors that are impacting their futures and their livelihoods. And so, you know, it, it really hasn't been an issue 
um, because we've, we've really gotten the communities to rally together and to be that force um, to take the initiative. So it really, really hasn't been a substantial issue for us. Can I just add one more thing? Um, I forgot to mention that we also, because of situations of violence and civil unrest, um, we've also done discrete projects and, and partnerships where we don't publicize anything. We just work with the women on the ground to, to do whatever work needs to happen. It doesn't exist in any of our collateral on any of our websites um, so, so that they can get the support they need without drawing any sort of attention that might put them in danger. So, so our work definitely does do that as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I guess we can stop the question answer session at this point. First, I would like to ask our panelists to put their email addresses into the chat for all our audience for them to reach out to you and Kahea, you're absolutely right. The conversations about climate sometimes are not as public. Uh, a recording of this session will actually go up on our website. So that will be public. But first I want to call on our audience to unmute and videos and audio and to give a loud round of applause to our panelists for this absolutely wonderful session. So please unmute and go for it. Hey. Hey. Good job. Thank you. Good. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for having the patience to hang around for such a long time and listen to this wonderful conversation. I will now reach out to Beth Ellen for some closing remarks. And after Beth Ellen officially concludes the event, uh, the session is over. The Zoom link is not in our control. It will disappear at 9, 10 p.m. But if all of you just want to hang out as if you're hanging out in a room and have informal conversations, go for it. Beth Ellen? Thank you, Vina. Am I? Okay, great. I'm up. I'm, uh, you can hear me, I hope. Um, I am just overwhelmed, as I am sure you are as well, with what is happening uh, with uh, our partners, what's happening with our youth, what's happening in all these wonderful places around the world. And I think it's really clear that global gender equality and climate justice have to go hand in hand to ensure that we have a clean, healthy, and sustainable future. And so I, I just want to um, call out a few of the things that I heard that really impacted me. Um, and, you know, you know, first, the, when we were talking about the ongoing challenge in our work, the siloing ish of the issues as if uh, climate change and gender equality and racial justice and all of these things are separate issues. And, and it's really just a matter of which one is coming to the forefront at the moment that you're talking. They're also inter, inter, they are also interconnected. And to really um, it start to embrace the intersectionality, not just of some um, marginal of the of maybe um, um, marginalized issues, but to bring the issues of people and and um, justice issues together. I love the quote, and I can't remember who says this, but we need to complicate the work. We don't hear that very often when we're running organizations, but I think that that is so important. We need to complicate the work. We need to bring in more ideas about uh, how we're approaching things and not be stuck in our silos. Um, uh, one thing that Ashley said uh, is that at the center of the complexity is women and girls bearing the brunt of these issues. Um, I loved hearing about the collective action and the negotiating with gov governments and, and the policy work that's being done. 
the intergenerational work that's being done with Women's Earth Alliance. Um, what's happening with the youth and, and uh, listening to, um, actively listening to what the youth are saying because they, and respecting and believing what their truth is. Um, the Climate Ambassadors Program at UNICEF. And, and the thing that UNICEF, that, um, that Alicia ended with that I think is really just something that we can end this whole session with. And that is that the need for cooperation and what affects one of us affects all of us. And that is true in all of these issues. So I just, want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. I, I am excited to follow up with all the panelists about many of the things that you said. And thank you all of you for joining us uh, and learning about these organizations, about UNICEF um, and about Together Women Rise. And thank you to all of our members who came. It, it really means so much to us that you're here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Beth Ellen. As one of my last thank yous, I want to thank UNICEF USA. They were the ones who brought us to CSWs, to the CSWs some years ago. And ever since then, we have been hosting these sessions. We bring our grantees and amplify their voices. And so it's once again, like all of you said, partnerships, partnerships, partnerships. Um, I believe we can stop recording so uh, our members can go wild, even though it's a little late on the East Coast. <laughs>